Ralph Baer, widely considered the Thomas Edison of video games, created the first home console system, the Magnavox Odyssey. But the, the whole difference between what others did and what I did is that I had the vision that there are 40 million TV sets up there that can't do anything except tune in a local two or three channels. The Magnavox company has come up with an electronic game simulator that will transform the family TV set into a playground. I mean, you just couldn't believe it. I mean, this was, you know, at home, on your TV, video games? This is like crazy world. This isn't the future. I twiddle it, who's my paddle from left to right? Even before Bear changed the face of television, he had lived the reality of war. He escaped Nazi Germany with his family before the Holocaust and was later drafted to fight in World War II for the Americans. In what would deeply influence Bear and the history of video games, he found himself transferred to Normandy, France as an interrogator and surrounded by the tools of war. As it turned out, there were weapons all over the place. Mostly, uh, uh, they mostly came back from North Africa with the British. Everywhere you looked, you could find weapons. I got wrapped up in the guns. Uh, the guns have history. The guns have fascination, you know, they're mechanical things. I come back from the war with 18 tons of small arms, far as small arms. But Bear had gained more than a museum collection. To mentally cope with war, he had awakened his innate love for interaction with technology, a skill that would lead him to Sanders Associates in 1958. At the time, they made electronics for defense. And Ralph Bear was a young engineer working there who, whose background was in television technology. Bear was hired to build Cold War military technology. But soon he began working on the Brown Box, the prototype to the first home gaming console, the Magnavox Odyssey. We built we call the all-purpose box. The box played uh, you know, seven different games and allowed us to plug in a bunch of different accessories. And we produced a game that was fascinating and it survived. You know, and you can still play today and still have fun with, with nothing but extremely crude symbology on the screen. You want to score, Bill? Let's, let's, okay, one or nothing. Don't play a conservative game. They're all going to be switches. Here we go. Now I'm going to do a little English on you. Oops. Damn. Ralph Baer had changed how the world viewed television forever. But like the pioneers before him, all the fun and games were funded by US dollars. If you have a really serious and very techy job, you're looking for a little bit of fun job, you know, and that, that's how really video games were born. Somebody screwing around with an oscilloscope, figuring out how to do tennis for two. And with Ralph Baer especially, you know, working in such a serious field, I, I think sometimes he had to sit back and really enjoy all this technology that he got to work with instead of just using it for, you know, destruction. <laughs> no other company offers you as many different video game cartridges as Atari. Bushnell enlisted former co-worker Al Alcorn to program the first arcade game. He gave me my first project, uh, which was to build a simple ping pong game with one ball moving and that score. And he told me that he had a contract from General Electric, but he didn't really have a contract with GE. It was just spinning him. Well, I, I felt that he would need to think that it wasn't just a train. The spin paid off, and the Pong prototype was ready. Once I'd gotten the game to where it played pretty well, Nolan said it had to have sound, and he said, I wanted to have, he says, I want to have the sound of a crowd approving, and somebody else said, I want to have hisses and boos if you lose. And I'm thinking, I, I have no way idea how to make this at all. I'm already way over my budget. I got too many chips in this thing as it is. So I simply poked around with a little audio amplifier in the circuit and found tones that sounded about right and wired them in. It was less than half a chip to put those sounds in. And I said, that's it, Nolan. He got it working in three days. I mean, which I was baffled by. I mean, he's so good. And then we changed one little thing. When the ball hit the different segments on the paddle, the angle went up, and all of a sudden it went from a ho-hum game to a knockout fun game. That little change was DC and daylight, night and day. When Atari unleashed Pong on the world in 1972, the video game industry was born. Pong was the beginning of everything. I mean, um, Pong was the first game, video game, that people could play. 
that was not inside of a lab somewhere. So I wrote the first instructions for Pong, which was step one, ins insert quarter. Step two, ball will serve automatically. Step three, avoid missing ball for a high score. And that was all it, that's all it took, so it was very easy to play. Any of us who was around for Pong remembers the first moment we played Pong the way people remember the Kennedy assassination, because we had the power of the pixel. Don't watch television tonight. Play it. I grew up in a pub in Liverpool in England, and um, my dad came in one day with a large piece of furniture which a couple of guys hauled into the bar that was as big as this. Of course, it was Pong, uh, the predecessor to, to, to just about every game. The other odd thing about Pong was it was a two-player game. It required, required two people to play. You really couldn't play it by yourself. 